Welcome to Almost Here, Around the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used. We're just around the corner from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hey, this is Richard Jacobs with Future Tech Podcast. My guest today is Jan Vich. Uh, he's the uh, professor at the Department of Genetics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City. Jan, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Well, good. Uh, I'd like to talk today about your research, if that's okay. Can you give listeners just a brief background of, of what it entails? Absolutely. Well, I'm uh, I'm still working on something that I uh, started to work on uh, in uh, the 1980s when I was still a student. I I've been fascinated by uh, the process of aging uh, ever since I, uh, I I heard a talk when I was doing my uh, undergraduate work at the University of Leiden in in the Netherlands. There was an, uh, somebody from the United States, one of the guest speakers, who was talking about uh, about aging. That was Roy Wolfort, uh, the late uh, Roy Wolfort. He became very famous later because he's the one who uh, did a lot of work on. Uh, dietary restrictions showing that you can extend lifespan of multiple uh, organisms by by uh, just simply feeding them a low caloric diet so let them eat very little uh, but but he gave a fascinating talk and he actually mentioned the possibility that we we age because uh, damage is accumulating in our dna in the dna of our cells and tissues so i never forgot mm. that i was always fascinated by that and then as soon as I could, I started my own research around that same topic. So that's essentially the possibility that we age because mutations uh, accumulate uh, in the DNA of our cells and tissues. So, so that's okay. essentially my research ever since. I, I really never changed. I just, uh, the, only, the only, well, I, you can call it a disappointment, is that in 1985 or so when I started this, I sort of expected to be where I'm now, like in 1990. So you can imagine I'm running 28 years, 27 years behind. So it's oh, all wow. more difficult than uh, I ever expected. So the research isn't boring. It it never gets old. You could uh, make the bad joke. It right? never gets old. That's uh, that's a wise thing to say. Yes. So what in particular are you um, finding through your research? You've spent many years, you know, 30 some odd years, uh, working on it. What what are you looking at? Are you trying to prevent aging? Are you trying to just understand it? What, what's the focus of your research? Well, the focus, my focus is really to understand aging. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the DNA in our cells and tissues, the, the genome, is, uh, is critically important, of course, because it's the repository of all the information that you need to provide function to your cells and therefore to the whole body. So uh, if something goes wrong with your DNA, then you really have a problem. You, uh, you cannot really uh, uh, make correct proteins anymore, and, and, and functions can no longer be carried out. So for this reason, uh, we have a fantastic DNA repair system. So there's, there's always a lot of damage to DNA, because there are lots and lots of uh, uh, sources of damage. Like, for example, there's always a little bit of uh, cosmic radiation to which you're exposed. But probably much more seriously, um, there are negative byproducts of your metabolism. They call them free radicals, for example. So uh, just the way we breathe is very efficient. It generates energy that we need. But unfortunately, uh, while your mitochondria and your cells are doing that, there's always like free radical byproducts. And they can actually damage your DNA quite severely. And there are many other uh, sources of uh, of damage into your DNA. Probably, and um, that's an estimate, of course, there are maybe as many as 100,000 uh, chemical lesions, like breaks in DNA or, or, or altered bases, uh, per, per day in each of your cells. So that's a huge amount. So again, without very good DNA repair systems, you would already die very, very quickly in split seconds. But we have those systems, and they are very old. Uh, the first... Uh, organisms ever alive on this planet, so very simple, we call it proto-cells, they already had that. And, and in fact, it's highly conserved because there are not, there's in fact, uh, not so much, not so many differences between the repair systems we have and the repair systems simple microorganisms have. Uh, I mean, there are differences, of course, but still, there, 
the similarities are striking. So those are highly conserved systems, and you need them. But they make mistakes. They make mistakes, and that means that they can, uh, when they try to restore the original situation, they put the wrong base pair in, or they, uh, when there are breaks in the DNA, they they put the wrong ends together. When there are multiple breaks, uh, then these these ends these ends of your DNA fragments they can migrate away from each other, and then they can uh, uh, well they can anneal to the wrong uh, to the wrong ends. So you can you can get this kind of problems, and we call those mutations. The difference between the actual damage, like a break. And a mutation is that a mutation really alters the information content of your genome, and mutations cannot be repaired because your repair enzymes can recognize damage, but they cannot recognize when the message looks different, so altered base pair sequence. They cannot see that. So that's why we know that mutations must accumulate, and they do, of course, in your germ cells because the, the fact that there are these mutations, that's the basis for life itself. This is, this is why life has so many forms. Mm. Uh, all these mutations, they accumulate, and then the most successful pieces of information, they survive. Uh, and since the environment changes all the time, you need to change your uh, genetics also. And that's what, in, that's what the organisms have done. That's why there, there's not one organism, but there are many, many different types of organisms. And they still change. That's what evolution does. Evolution plays with this variation. That's how you get this, uh, all these different organisms. So, But of course, if these... Uh, these same mutations happen in your somatic cells. That's n that's no longer fun because that means that they they uh, make a cell suddenly stop functioning as it should be. And this is also how we get cancer when the when there's a mutation in a gene that's involved in 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 growth of the of the cells. Then, uh, for example, make them grow very quickly. Then that could be the basis for cancer. And there are many other types of mutations that can contribute to uh, getting to you getting a malignant tumor, for example. We know that. So, so mutations definitely cause cancer. Uh, that, that's, that's very well known now. And also, cancer is an age-related disease. So it, it, the, your risk for cancer increases exponentially with age. And of course, you, it's, it's not like strange to suggest that that actually is, because mutations accumulate during the aging process in your tissues and, and cells. And that's exactly what we are studying. And, and that's why it's so important, in my opinion. But in fact, you can also uh, hypothesize at least that at some point when you grow older and older and older, the number of mutations in each cell is so high that they can actually begin to affect the fitness of the cell, so the functioning of the cell itself. So it's not only that they, they can give you cancer, but they may also uh, cause a cell to, uh, to divide slowly, like, for example, an immune cell that has to quickly respond to a challenge by a new bacterial infection that can no longer divide so quickly because it has a mutation in a gene that, uh, that uh, contributes to growth. So sort of the opposite mutation that can give you cancer is a mutation that makes you grow slower, so respond slower to a challenge. And there are many other types of mutations. You can also uh, uh, easily imagine mutations in your brain cells, in your neurons, for example, that at the end of the day could contribute to you getting Alzheimer's disease. So in other words... What my lab is studying is the possibility that uh, mutations ever reach such high levels that it can give you functional loss in your cells and tissues. That may sound like fairly mm. but it's not. And the reason is that we have no methods. We never had methods to measure mutations uh, accurately. And the reason that we don't have those, those methods is because mutations, they are random. They're different from cell to cell. So the only way to really study them is to pick out individual cells from your tissues and then study those individual cells. And that used to be very, very hard. But now, uh, that's a fairly recent accomplishment, accomplishment of not only my lab, but various other labs as well, is that we actually managed to be able to do that. We can now, uh, and we just published a nice paper on that in the journal Nature Method, where we show that we can actually accurately take a single cell from, uh, from, from your blood or from a tissue and then uh, do a whole genome sequencing, so sequence the entire genome and then pick out uh, where that genome is no longer as it should be. Namely, it's no longer as it was in your original germ, in, in, your, in your original zygote that, that, that gave rise to, the whole, to, to your, you as an individual. It, it has undergone changes, mu uh, mutations. And actually quite a lot, we found out that uh, there can be as many as a thousand per cell, and maybe in some cell types many more than that. So therefore, it's actually the first time that we can now say that mutations may actually contribute to uh, to aging in another way than only cancer. That, that's novel. In the old days, 
we we uh, let's say uh, 10, 10, 20 years ago, we we developed mouse models. We we gave them like a marker gene. We made transgenic mouse models and also later fly models in Drosophila that. Uh, sort of uh, put a marker gene in all your cells and tissues, and we, we developed methods to isolate those markers. And based on the markers, we could say how many mutations there were in the whole tissue. That was, those were powerful methods, because you can also uh, see if mutations accumulate with HIV, they do, as we conclusively demonstrated. And you can even treat a mouse or a fly with an agent, like a radiation or something else, and then see that the mutations increase. We could do all these things, but that is not the same as being able to look to all possible mutations in your normal cells and tissues of an aging organism. And that is something we can do now. We can do it only because of technology that we developed very recently. So that's essentially uh, what we did. I, I, I had to develop technology for measuring mutations, and I did that for decades already, because otherwise I couldn't actually study the mutations in relation to aging. And that's now what we finally... Okay. A quick question here: um, Why, in in young organisms, you know, kids, let's say, are these mutations building up, or is it, or is the body so efficient when you're at a young age that it it uh, keeps them at a certain level or or at a low level? And after, is there a breaking point where you start to accumulate more and more, or is it your entire life you're accumulating more and more mutations? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. We don't know. We, we do know that mutations accumulate, but the variation between uh, individuals is so high, and and now as we now find, also the the variation between different individual cells is so high that we cannot easily say if there is such a breaking point. The only thing we can I can tell you is that they definitely mutations definitely accumulate. Maybe uh, when you're old, you have like uh, three or four times as many mutations in your cells as when you're fairly young. And when I say young, I mean like a young adult. So I'm not talking about uh, uh, a very early embryo, because in a, in a very early embryo, there are even less. In the starting point, in the zygote, the fertilized egg, there is zero. So, uh, but, but again, we are now studying more and more individuals. We're studying humans now, and also many more individual cells. So we will be able in the future to, to say that, to actually to see if, for example, early on, the accumulation is not so steep. And then there is such a breaking point, as you, as you just mentioned. Maybe, maybe I just say something when you're 40 or 50, suddenly you see that the accumulation goes faster. Because that's the point you're trying to make, isn't it? Uh, is there like a point where you see for some reason uh, the, the rate of increase of mutation suddenly takes off and it's much more than it was. Now, uh, there is yeah, some... What, I, what, I'm, what I'm asking you is, um, let's say, I'm just throwing out, let's say there's 100 new mutations a day and your body is able to um, reduce the mutations by 120 a day. So you're, you're, you're okay, you're keeping it at bay. And then at a certain point, the mutations grow to 125 a day, and you're only able to fix or you know, repair 120 a day. Now you're starting on the path, let's say, towards having more than you did before. It's increasing. Right, right. but we already you, do you noticed... see there's a... Yeah, I, I see you see point, that kind of behavior. That, that cannot. Uh, that that is not true. We know that because uh, mutations cannot be fixed. So once there is a mutation, uh, there are no uh, enzymatic systems to take care of it, to uh, to take mutations away. You cannot do that. So mutations are irreversible. There are no systems to to get rid of them in any other way than cell death. So if the number of mutations in a particular cell becomes too high then it's possible that that cell commits suicide, so you you may lose it. Also, your immune uh, system may be able to take care of it. We don't know that. So what you say may to some extent be true, if when you're still young, that you're able to quickly see if a cell has too many mutations. When there are too many, then there's an effect on the fitness of the cell, and the cell becomes less fit, then that can be detected, of course, and then it may be that there are mechanisms to get rid of the cell. And then when there are still stem cells around, you can uh, generate new cells that are, again, healthy and do not contain so many mutations. That, that may be the case. That's possible. Uh, but but as, I, as I said, we don't really know that yet. Uh, we do know that even fairly young individuals, like people in their 30s, already have accumulated mutations as compared to people in, who are really very young, like a couple of years old. 
So maybe what what's happening is that you said cell death is what takes care of mutated cells that that don't function properly. That's but the only it thing. sounds like it sounds like your body is there. Your cells are always mutating, but they're mutating in such a way that you know certain ones die, certain ones don't. And then over time, the ones that aren't dying still able to function, but have more and more errors are accumulating, and you have less and less cells that are, I guess, quote unquote, pure or less mutated. And over time, you build up, I guess, your whole body transitions to these cells that are changed in many ways, but still able to continue on. And they produce new cells that are similar to them. So it sounds like the entire composition of your cells change over your life. Your whole body is is mutating and changing over your life is what it sounds like. I don't know if that's an accurate statement. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I I think I just listened carefully to what you just said, and I think you're exactly right. That that's precisely what uh, what we think happens. So there is this accumulation of mutations, but there's also uh, more and more cell death. In, in, there are various mechanisms for that. Now, one very nice example that sort of illustrates the point that you just made is hematopoietic stem cells. So the stem, cell in, stem cells in your bone marrow that give rise to your lymphocytes that carry out uh, your immune functions. Now, we, we now know that uh, the, the body, of course, has to uh, use these stem cells all the time to, uh, to replace worn-out cells. That's what, it's, that's what it does. And it uses, a ver- uh, initially when you're young, it uses a very large number of different stem cells. But we now know also that when you grow older, then uh, it can use only uh, a smaller and smaller number of stem cells for that purpose. Now, when there is a mutation in one of these stem cells, then all the daughter cells contain the same mutation. And this is exactly what was observed. So in very old people, actually people over 100, they found that in some of them, uh, when they study hematopoietic uh, cells, like blood lymphocytes, for example, they see that there are somatic mutations that are actually the same mutation actually occurs in, for example, 30% of all the cells. So then you know that 30% of all your immune cells, they come up, they come from only one stem cell. That is not the case when you're very young. They never found that in young individuals. We actually uh, made the same observation. So what you now say is entirely correct. You, you can see that the whole composition of your cells is changing. And... Um, the number of uh, cells that come from the same stem cell increases. So more and more cells derive from only one or few stem cells. Well, when you're still young, that's not the case. So yes, there is a, there's, a, there's a whole switch in, in, uh, in cell composition during aging. But to be honest with you, we know very little about that yet. We know absolutely nothing how, uh, how that takes place in the liver, for example, because those cells don't divide so quickly as your blood cells, but still they divide. So there's very little known about that. So, uh, and that is actually where the single cell approach comes in because we are now studying, we, we, we have to use single cells, otherwise we cannot measure mutations. But single cell biology is now generally recognized as a very important uh, new field uh, by, uh, by itself. So people realize that you can only really say something about what happens to people when they grow old when you take a single cell approach, when you really start to look at many, many different cells in an organ or tissue that will give you a story of what happens to your cell composition when you grow old. So that's exactly the point. So, why, so now that you, you're able to characterize the level of mutation, why can't you profile the various cells in your body, pick the ones that seem to have the least mutations, culture them, maybe make them into pluripotent stem cells, and give a person a series of treatments and giving them back the best cells in you know pluripotent stem cell uh, or hematopotent uh, stem cell fashion and 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 regenerate them essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now the problem is that uh, for us to measure mutations, we have to kill the cells. So in other words, we we can take your cells from your bone marrow, or your blood. Let's say we take the stem cells from your bone marrow because that's of course important. So your your reasoning is well. We inspect them for mutations, and those who have too many mutations, you get rid of those, and we keep the ones who have low levels of mutations. But that's exactly what we cannot do. In order to to look at the mutation uh, frequency, we have to take the the single cell, and we have to uh, lyse it and kill it and and study the DNA of the cell. So that's not possible. But 
what we could do, of course, is a little bit different. We can take these cells and study their function, sort of reasoning that when they have too many mutations, they don't function very well. So maybe we can take the, the bone marrow cells and do some tests where we test how they respond to a particular challenge. And then we can do what they call uh, facts analysis. So we flow sort the cell. So you can keep them alive in that way. And we do that based on how well they respond. So we, talk, we take only the best responders, and those cells we can put back into the bone marrow. That is a possibility, yes, but there's still lots and lots of problems in that approach. So I honestly think that that is probably very difficult to do. Mm. There, so, are, there are some variants on that approach. You can People found a phenomenon that they call cell competition. So it turns out that uh, it, if you have a mixture of highly competent, highly functional cells with cells that are not so competent and don't function so well, maybe because they're worn out, then the, the fresh, well-functioning cells, they sort of compete with the old cells. And the old cells, they die. They make them die. And then they can take over the population. This has been done in liver, for example. Actually, here in our, uh, in, in our institution, researchers have done that with liver. They do li liver transplantation. So they put uh, fresh, young liver cells in in, in, in animals that, that were irradiated, uh, you can irradiate the liver only, and then the cells are not going, the liver cells are not doing well anymore. But then the young cells, they take over the population. So that's sort of a variant on what you just proposed. So yes, this kind of things, we may be able to do this in the, in the future. It's not very clear. It, it's possible. Absolutely. Okay. So what's, what are the short-term and long-term goals of your particular research then? Well, uh, when I say short term, you know, I, I just told you at the beginning of our conversation that uh, I already uh, run like uh, 30 years behind or so. But anyway, uh, let's call it short term. My short term goal is very clear. I'm now uh, studying human tissues. I I get samples from uh, from human livers, from uh, from human muscle, from uh, memory gl glands, so breast tissue. And I take the individual cells and I study them for the number and the types of mutations, trying to predict if these mutation loads can actually contribute to the aging process, can actually lead to dysfunctional cells. So it's a very simple, uh, straightforward application of the technology that we now develop. But I can assure you that this is much more difficult than uh, you would think. But still... My my feeling now, and, and again, I may be too optimistic, but I should be able to to do that over the next, let's say, five years or so. And based on that conclusion, based on what we find, let's I mean, let's assume that we can conclusively say that mutations really are a major cause of aging, which again is is not sure if we can actually do that, because many of the technologies for that still have to be developed. I mean, even even if we know exactly how many mutations there are and where they are, then we still need to develop the computational tools and the statistical tools to actually prove that this contributes to functional decline. We, we are working on that. So I, I'm optimistic now. So let's say it's five years. Yeah, then we have to do what you uh, sort of just said. Then we have to try to find ways to fix those problems. And those, those can indeed uh, involve some stem cell work, trying to... Uh, to get stem cells uh, from these different organs and sort of infuse the, first check those stem cells and pick the, the ones that still function very well and then to infuse those stem cells in your organs and tissues to, uh, to hopefully take over the, the, sort of rejuvenate the organs. Now that, that is an approach that is still very vague. I, I honestly, I can see where this might be going, but I wouldn't know. But on the other hand, we could begin to to try that already now. And in fact, people have started to, to do that, as I just pointed out. So so maybe right. in five years, we also have made progress in that area. And uh, But, you know, you're probably aware of it. Stem cells, a couple of years ago, they were extremely gung-ho about it. And now they sort of like are a little bit more pessimistic because so little has happened since five years ago. So you see, so we, we, nev we can never predict what happens. Have you um, been able to profile uh, organisms that don't live nearly as long, like you said, Drosophila, the fruit flies, or or rats? You know, they have a much shorter lifespan. Have, have you Absolutely. tried profiling their cells and their mutation levels yeah, at all that's, stages that's of their a life? Very, it's a very good question. It's exactly 
what we are now doing in one of our projects. We have multiple research projects, but in one of these projects, we collaborate with uh, Vera Gorbinova in, in, uh, in Rochester, New York, and she has a whole collection of animals that uh, rodents, actually. They're all rodents. So in, in, in other words, they are, evolutionary speaking, fairly close, but yet there are, they show some very big differences in lifespan. For example, the most... Uh, the most extreme here is the difference between a mouse and a naked mole rat. They're about the same size, small animals. A mouse in, uh, lives in the lab only like three years. A naked mole rat can live at least 30 years, maybe even more than that. So the question is why? Now, our hypothesis is that when you take cells from a naked mole rat, they have less mutation spontaneously. Or when you, give them, when you treat them with a mutagen, like radiation, that they actually are capable to repair damage with few mistakes. So in other words, there are few mutations being generated by that agent. This is precisely what we are testing now. And the first results, but this very preliminary, suggest that that actually might be true. We, we do see that, that the mouse in general, when you take a mouse cell uh, or you take a human cell or a naked mole rat cell, that the human and naked mole rat cells have less mutations than the mouse. But we are, this is really very prelim, preliminary. It's very difficult to make those comparisons. And uh, But it looks like that actually might be the case. Another comparison, and you also uh, mentioned that in the first sentence, uh, is a comparison between a very short-lived animal, like a fly, a, a drosophila, and, uh, and a human or a mouse. Now, already earlier, using the uh, the old methodologies, like what I, what I told you about the marker gene that we put into a mouse and we put it into a drosophila, there already it seemed that drosophila has way more mutations than a mouse. But now we are, for the first time, really looking at it in a very comprehensive way, because now we take single cells from a fly and single cells from a mouse, and we are in the process of sequencing that. Now, I cannot give you the answer because we are actually in the middle of that. It will take a couple of more months before, before we know. But, of course, we hypothesize that the total number of mutations in a fly is much higher than that in a mouse. But we don't know that yet. So the whole basis for lifespan may be the different rates of mutation accumulation. That, that may be true, but I have to say also that uh, I personally uh, think aging is multifactorial. There's, there are so many different aging processes mm. going on simultaneously that I think it's a bit naive to assume that uh, mutations are the only cause of aging. It, it may be one of the causes, maybe even a major cause, of course, but I, I doubt very, very much that this is really the only thing around. I mean... Uh, there's also a very old hypothesis uh, about proteins, uh, errors in proteins. It was already proposed in the 1960s by Leslie Orgel. They call it the protein error catastrophe theory. It's essentially the same as uh, DNA somatic mutations. And, and also, th the reason they could never test it is also the same. Because the frequency of these events, first of all, they occur randomly... And, and the frequency of, of these events is extremely low when you look at the whole tissue. So you really look at, the, at it cell by cell, as we now can do for DNA mutations. But for protein errors, they can still not do that. So we will still not be able to test mm. it. So, uh, as I just pointed out, in, in this uh, somatic mutation hypothesis, it's, it's also very old. It's from the 1950s, actually. And, and still we have not been able to test it. We are now testing it for the first time. And, and I'm not even so confident that we will know the answer uh, within five years. So, you know, these things take time. And aging is a very difficult process, and it's most likely multifactorial. There are multiple different processes uh, going on. I mean, no wonder why it's so fascinating. Um, it is. It, it definitely is. It's yeah. probably the most fascinating problem in, uh, in medical biology, because look at it this way. I mean, aging is really the root cause of all the diseases that now trouble us. Look, we, we, we were very, uh, we've been very effective in getting rid of most uh, so-called normal diseases that occur also early on. Yes, I know there are still kids who get cancer and they die from it, of course. But on the other hand, we made enormous progress in actually curing them. I mean, childhood cancer is one of the few cancers that we managed to cure uh, after all, and this is in kids. So many diseases in young people we can take care of now. But what we uh, cannot do is take care of the AIDS-related diseases. And they all have one thing in common, and that's the 
aging process itself, whatever that may be. That could be mutation accumulation, that could be the accumulation of protein errors, it could be other type of uh, protein problems or, or, or lipid problems or cellular problems that, that uh, accumulate during the aging process. But those undoubtedly have one thing in common, and that is that they all in some way uh, promote the occurrence of all these nasty diseases that eventually we, we're going to die from. So that's why it would make so much sense to 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 uh, spend our money to a large extent to study aging because then we may capture all these diseases in one stroke when we have drugs and now the first drugs begin to emerge where we apparently target aging itself then then maybe we can target also the diseases of old age uh, all together and we can make much more progress there than we actually make now because there's not so much progress in curing cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, and you know very well. Well, 99% of all our money is going to those diseases separately, and, and, and the results are actually pretty disappointing. So maybe much smarter to try to approach it from another angle and, and, uh, and look at all those, uh, uh, look at the aging process itself, which unites all those diseases. And again, I, I'm not saying that that will immediately give us the results that we want, because as I also pointed out to you, we don't even know the basic causes of aging. We, uh, and if that turns out that mutations, random mutations are the key, the key thing here, then we may, it may take even longer before we can fix that. But still, you got my point, I guess. I mean, uh, there is something in aging that gives you all these nasty diseases. So it makes a lot of sense to, to focus more on aging and try to develop drugs that delay aging. You know, that would be a lot already. Because, we, because I told you we may not be able to cure mutations, but we, we we are certainly able to delay them if we know uh, all these uh, sources of mutations that occur during the aging process, and we can delay the, those uh, those uh, processes. Then, of course, it takes much longer before your cells have accumulated so many mutations that you're going to see uh, uh, functional uh, defects. So that may be a very good oh. thing already, and we have some evidence for that because there are. Uh, uh, for example, dietary restriction. We know that that uh, increases lifespan and it also reduces age-related diseases in, in, in animal models, of course, but still. Uh, and, and we also have shown a lot earlier, actually, that uh, dietary restricted mice, that they also delay mutation accumulation. That was still when we had the old methods of doing it, but I'm sure it will, we, will, we will find the same thing when we use our single cell assay. So you so you see, there's a lot we can. Yeah, there's a lot we can do. I'm, I'm sorry, Andrew. I'm just sir. We're yeah, we're just about out of time. But um, yeah. this is a great discussion. I mean, we could talk for a long time about it. The um, I just wanted to end with, and I, again, I, I really hate to get you off, but uh, you have no, so much great fine. info. What what are some resources for listeners to find out more about your work and aging in general? Where where would you recommend they look, or you know, if they wish to contact you and, and find out more, how can they do it? Oh, they can always uh, send me an email. I mean, they can find me uh, on the website of my institution. And there's also uh, a lot of information on our website uh, about aging research as it is being done here at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine because I'm only one of uh, many uh, who are doing uh, aging research here because Albert Einstein College of Medicine happens to be uh, one of the largest, some would say the largest, aggregate of investigators who are studying aging in the country, maybe even in the world. So there's a lot of information here. We have an, we have an institute for aging research, and they'll, they will find all that when they go to uh, the website of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Well, very good. Jan, thank you so much for coming, and I, I really appreciate your time. It was great. You're most welcome. Take care. Okay. Bye. All right. Take care, sir. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post a review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.